Welcome to Points of View with San Francisco Ballet. We are pleased to offer this free online series that captures the views of company dancers, choreographers, rehearsal directors, and other artists. This episode of Points of View will explore Program 5, The Colors of Dance, which runs from March 14th through the 19th and includes Helgi Thomason's Seven for Eight, Miles Thatcher's Color Forms, and William Forsyth's Blake Works One. This Points of View will be moderated by dance educator Mary Wood. Mary has moderated the Points of View program since 1986 and Meet the Artist interviews since 1995, and she has taught technique and ballet history at San Francisco Ballet School. In this episode, we'll hear from Tina LeBlanc, rehearsal director and a former principal dancer who created a role in Thomason's Seven for Eight when it premiered in 2004. Choreographer Miles Thatcher will talk about the journey of color forms from stage concept to dance film during the pandemic and now the highly anticipated stage debut. And Katita Waldo, rehearsal director and former principal dancer who has danced numerous roles by Forsyth, will share insights about the creation process of Blake Works One. And now let's hear their points of view. Well, I would uh, start by saying thank you to Jasmine and I want to say hello, and I am just delighted to be in conversation with rehearsal director, Tina LeBlanc. Hi. An friend, <laughs> and um, a longtime principal dancer with the company who's now sharing her experience as a rehearsal director. So a little introduction for you, Tina. Tina received her early training with Central Pennsylvania Youth Ballet, who has provided many dancers for San Francisco Ballet. Um, and the Joffrey too, and then subsequently she performed with the Joffrey Ballet for four years. She joined San Francisco Ballet as a principal dancer in 1992, where her repertoire included the entire range of the full-length classics, Giselle, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, Romeo and Juliet, Nutcracker, Don Quixote, I can't think if I've left any out, <laughs> And then um, the works, of course, of George Balanchine, Jerome Robbins, William Forsyth, uh, Sir Frederick Ashton, and uh, Laura Lubavitch. And then uh, I have to say, we fondly remember her definitive performance as the cowgirl in Agnes DeMille's Rodeo. Tina also created roles in uh, works by high profile choreographers, including Mark Morris, Christopher Wilden, Yuri Killian, Stanton Welch, and of course, many others. She's received two Princess Grace Awards and two Isadora Duncan Awards. <clears throat> in 2009, she retired from San Francisco Ballet Company performing, but joined the faculty of the San Francisco Ballet School. And then in 2019, she transitioned to becoming a rehearsal director for the company. So formally welcome, Tina, and thank you so much for taking this time today. My pleasure, Mary. And I'm just going to make one little correction, although it's not good for me because it makes me seem older, but um, I was actually with the Joffrey for a total of 10 years. Wow. We need to go into Wikipedia. And <laughs> I know, Wikipedia. 10 years. I joined, uh, I joined the Joffrey too. I was there for a year and a half and then another eight and a half with the company. Yeah. Well, my memory is that you joined San Francisco Ballet very shortly after you were on the cover of our trade journal dance magazine. And I remember at the time, that was very impressive that we were getting a cover, a cover <laughs> dancer uh, in our company as a principal. Well, moving sort of forward to your work with um, the company um, and over the time that you spent as a dancer, and of course, transitioning into being a rehearsal assistant or director, um, you were in the original cast of uh, Helgi's Seven for Eight, which opens program five, which we will be able to see performed this week. And you, because you joined the company really within the first 10 years of Helgi's time at San Francisco Ballet, uh, he was just sort of getting established as a choreographer, but you then had the opportunity to be in many, many of the works that he created throughout all those years. 
that's a good jumping off place for us. Talk about Helgi the choreographer and the range of his works and some of the things that we might have come to expect from a Helgi Thomason work. Yeah, you know, um, he's done quite a, a wide variety of, of things from uh, Chi Lin for, for Yuan Yuan to Nana's lead, which was, you know, so dramatic, uh, to light classical things like, like Prism, um, like Seven for Eight, although Seven for Eight does have those beautifully slow uh, sections that are, you know, um, have a sadness almost to them, but so beautiful. Um, something like Crisscross, which had the two sections, you had the, the, the sprightly and the you know more traditional yeah he's done quite a bit uh quite a range you know um and when he gets in the studio i <laughs> i was also in his original nutcracker and one moment stands out in my mind which is not unusual for him to kind of go is it possible <laughs> And then I'll throw something out there. You go, okay, let's try. <laughs> well, okay. So that tells me that his choreographic style might have been based on working in the room with the dancer. Uh, talk about his use of his dancers in creating. Yes, I, I think very much so. I, I think that he probably has an idea in his head. Um, and then when he sees it, or it, um, he relies very much on the dancer to bring what they do and whether something works or something doesn't, um, I think he chooses dancers that inspire him. Um, it, for instance, in Seven for Eight, I have a strong memory of the adagio that starts the ballet our very first rehearsal, he had four couples doing that, four couples doing the same thing. And of course, you know, I'm a very different dancer than Yuan Yuan Tan. <laughs> and so as her legs were going up and I'm struggling, I'm like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> but he definitely saw that this was a pot of dough, not mm -hmm. you know, four couples. And he changed that to, to showcase her. And it, it is absolutely exquisite. Um, I think that all along he kind of does that. He he plays with the dancers until he gets what he's looking for, what's in his mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Helgi has always been called out by critics and, and fans alike for his musicality. And every in interview I've ever seen with him talked about how he was inspired by his music. What more can you say about that, having been inside of those works to that music you know um i remember seeing him dance i was a young student during the summer at sab i remember those last uh, last year or two that he was dancing um we were i was always so excited to see him dance such a musical dancer the piece that stands out in my mind of, of seeing him was stars and stripes so musical so uh, a little cheeky you know just so much personality. Um, when he choreographs, I feel like he choreographs the way he hears the music, which is already phrased. Okay. So if you think of somebody like Balanchine, I've always looked at Balanchine as very, very square on the music, very much, um, not that it has to be account for every step, but still very square on the music so that you can actually squeeze here and pull that you as the dancer can play with it and I feel like Helgi does that with his choreography he already wants to see that because that's what he would have done that's where he would have pulled it out and so he he choreographs very much that way so the phrasing is kind of built in and when you think of the wide range of music that he's used what a lot to play with oh From yeah very classical and Bach, which is the Baroque end of classical to some of the very contemporary things we've seen and uh, even popular. Um, you've mentioned you were in the original cast of Seven for Eight. And, I'm, and you've talked a little bit about um, 
starting the very beginning of it and then beginning to mold it. I want to hear a little bit more about that period that was, goodness sakes, almost 20 years ago. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I hope I can remember some. <laughs> and how he was, um, you know, had been director for then for almost 20 years. Um, what sorts of things did do you remember from that new work compared to some of the other things that he he'd already done? Well, I think he I think he took these eight dancers and really made things tailored to them. You know, he used the slow music, long leggy movement mm -hmm. for Yuan Yuan and Yuri. And then the second movement, which is much brighter and has some speed to it, he gave to Gonzalo and I. Mm -hmm. And then the trio, which is um, a little playful, he gave to, you know, to uh, one of the other couples plus one of the girls. So everybody has a little something special mm -hmm. to, to do in the ballet. And um, I felt like he really played on our strengths. You know, of course I'm about speed. <laughs> speed, turning, jumping, <laughs> keep me moving. <laughs> and as I said frequently, the dazzle. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bach, the music is Bach, the four um, piano concerti, four of Bach's piano concerti. Um, it's a little atypical for ballet. Choreographers tend to kind of shy away from using Bach. And uh, in an interview, Helgi has said he, he tried something very early on and then he left it for another 10 or 15 years. Hmm. But then he came to Bach. Um, did you have any reaction to suddenly dancing to music that is as particular as Bach? Did it just seem like? Actually, weirdly, I have danced to Bach before. Um, I remember a piece from my childhood that I loved. Uh, it was called it was called Bachiana, <laughs> um, and I I mean I can still do some of it. I could, like it's in my body, it's in my brain from having done it so much as a child. I was probably about twelve when I did that. Um, and I'm sure that I'm somewhere along the way at Joffrey, I must have used some box. So I, I don't, I'm not drawn to any one particular composer. I, I like kind of a bit of everything and it depends on the individual piece, whether I'm drawn to it or not. And you have to admit the music for seven for eight is, is wonderful. I mean, the first section of the pot de deux are just so soft and quiet and, like I said, almost sad, so but beautiful. And um, and my section so so sprightly. Um it it seemed natural to me. No. Yeah. Well, actually, Helgi was quoted as saying, You have to love the music. That's half the battle. And uh, I would have to agree. I'm very much that way. I if if I don't like the the music, it's hard for me to like the ballet. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Well, let's jump ahead a little bit to, um, well, to talking about the ballet in the present, but also talking about the role that you are playing now uh, in your career, which is as a rehearsal director. This is an evolution for you. Uh, you spent a very successful year, uh, 10 years, I should say, as a teacher. And which I love. I love always, and I miss. <laughs> always. Um, associated you with expressing the joy of teaching and being able to transmit your experiences and the skills that you inherit well that you've inherited on to the next generations so how are how is that working for you you know what it's this working context <laughs> it's it's um i i love teaching i do i love taking young dancers and, and having, to, explaining things to them. And, you know, you might have to try three, four different ways for them to get it, but uh, it, there's always a key, you know, to ha let the light bulb turn on so that they better understand their bodies and what they should feel or what the, what it should look like or whatever. I mean, I really love that process. When Helgi asked me to become a rehearsal director, 
I had to think long and hard about it. I had to make a pros and cons list. I had to really talk it out with my husband. And then one day I was about to go into the studio to teach and two former students who are now company members came down just to say hi. And I was like, oh, well, of course. I'm going up there to be with the ones that I've helped get there <laughs> and help them maybe go a little bit further. Okay. Uh, so it, that really stuck out to me that, that of course I need to go upstairs <laughs> and it was, um, it's, it's a bit of a, a change. It's very different and it's taken me a while to settle in. And of course I, I went upstairs just as the pandemic started. So we were just beginning to put things on the stage and I was able to show my work when boom, shut down. Mm -hmm. So that was hard. Um, but I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it now. I, I still teach, uh, I still teach company and I still teach outside when I can. Uh, I've taught company. I mean, the school a couple of times. So, you know, I, I still get that in there. So I get my fix, but, um, but this is a whole nother ball game to take a ballet and be able to, to work it and work positions and work your dancers into what it should be and what looks better on them. And um, it's, it's quite fascinating. This is, is a two pronged question. Um, the main question is um, you've already said it's exciting, but to be in the front of the room instead of to be in the room as the dancer, um, two facets of that one looking at or working with a new choreographer, a choreographer who is staging a new work and being that choreographer's assistant must be one experience. And then an experience such as seventh grade, when you're looking at new, a new cast, do a work that you actually did. So uh, talk a little bit about those two facets of being in the front of the room. Right. Because um, I really I've had I've had that experience a few times where I have been the only assistant uh, to somebody creating a new work. And it's uh, it it can be overwhelming because they have their own vocabulary and it might not be your vocabulary, you know, or um, you're trying to learn everybody's part mm -hmm. when each of them only has to learn their own. So, you, you know, I found myself going to each person and saying, is this what you said? Or is this what you did? Is this the, what he wanted? Um, you know, in order to make sure my notes have all that in it. Now, coming to something like seven for eight, which I'm very familiar with, um, it's uh, it, sometimes something will just not look right. And I'll say to Anita, who's the primary rehearsal director on it, um, didn't we used to do it this way? <laughs> and she might say, you know, you're right. Or she might say, yeah, that got changed. <laughs> you know, so um, it, she had asked me to be in there so that it, there might be some things that come up where she doesn't know quite how to make it look right, or maybe they don't have the right feeling in their body so that it comes across a certain way. And I can help with that and help her um, kind of finesse it and make it look the way Helgi did envision it as, as much as possible. Because Helgi also might come in and say, you know what, I want it this way this time. <laughs> oh. So, you know, it's choreographer's prerogative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I understand that Helgi is still a presence in and out of the rehearsals. Oh, yeah. Particularly of his, his choreography. There's a, this is sort of the, 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 addressing the part of that question of being, looking at the ballet that you performed in. Is, and you've talked already about the fact there might be changes, but how much do you try to recreate the look and feel of that first cast that you already talked about that was so magical? Um, you've talked about Helgi's developing it on that particular set of dancers. Now there's a whole new generation working on it. Can you address that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I've experienced this with Nutcracker. Um, I've experienced it with Prism, one of Helgi's other ballets. I think when you bring something back 
you have to go back to the original for the feeling, for the for the flair. Sometimes an arm gets changed or a leg or even a whole entire step or phrase might get changed. I know that in Yuan Yuan's Pas de Deux, um, they have to watch a certain recording later to get the most recent version. They might go back to Yuri and Yuan Yuan um, to, to see musicality or how a certain partnering thing is done, but for the actual choreography, they have to go later because it was changed. It wasn't, it wasn't changed because the dancer didn't like it and kind of snuck something in there or, <laughs> or because they forgot nothing like that, or a mistake was made. Um, so I think always, I feel like you have to kind of go back to the original for the uh, initial feeling of a piece, the energy of it, the shapes, and then you might look at re more recent versions to see how much is different or how much might be different because of a, maybe a person couldn't do a step and Helgi changed it for them. So now you know, okay, well, now you have an option. Yeah. Does this look better on you or does this look better on you? You know, things like that happen too. Version A, version B. But I think for the for the overall look, mm -hmm. I like to I like to go back to the original. I think Anita does too. And of course, this is probably another whole discussion, but the can, the current cast brings personalities and development to the work mm -hmm. inevitably. And that must be fairly exciting. Yeah. Um, sometimes you see different different things. You know, one thing that always stood out on one dancer might not stand out as much on this dancer, but something else does, yeah. you know? Uh, and he does really like different personalities for this particular ballet. He wants to see a lot of personality. So you don't want to just be a blank slate. You want to bring yourself and your, you know, depending on your, your part, your feeling for that to it. Well, as we are winding down our last few minutes, um, Two questions occur to me. One is, how do you want the audience to receive Seven for Eight? When they go home and they reflect over the program, what would be your hope for the effect that this, this work, this piece has? Um, I think, the except for the slow parts, which I said have, have something of a melancholy feel to them, uh, but they're so exquisite. I hope they leave with a feeling of brightness, even though the costumes are black, they're quite pretty and flattering. Um, and the unison work can be so beautiful. Um, I think, I think in the end, they should leave feeling joyous, feeling happy. I find it a happy ballet. <laughs> I I'm so looking forward to seeing it again. And I, I'm remembering a sense of elegance and also just the, and loveliness. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so my last question for you. Um, when you present the, the work of Helgi Thomason to a new generation of dancers, imagine yourself presenting the works of, let's say Balanchine or Robbins or some of the other prior generations of choreographers. Um, you try to explain what that choreographer was all about so that your dancers will explain, will understand what they're doing. Can you think of how you might present the works of Helgi Thomason to a new generation of dancers? What do you want them to get from learning his work? The word that generally comes to mind when I think about what I've done of Helgi's of course, I'm the smaller dancer, the faster, the spinner, the mover. Um, I think playful. When I when I see in my mind him choreographing, I always feel like he's playing with the music. He's playing, you know, even something somber. There's uh, there's so much work with the music that um, I guess I guess musicality has to come into it musicality, playfulness. And I tend, because I have worked with 
Helgi and not with Balanchine and not with Robbins. I am, when I do Balanchine or Robbins, I am using the information I got secondhand. Yeah. But when I work with Helgi, I can pass on what I feel, my interpretation of what he felt or what he meant. Um, so it's a little bit closer to the source there. <laughs> um, and sometimes certain movements or phrases, I will actually have a memory of, of how he would demonstrate it. So I can pass that on. That's so valuable. And San Francisco Ballet is so lucky to have raised up this generation of rehearsal directors such as yourself who are going to be passing things on. Um, I just, uh, we've reached the end of our time. I wanna thank you so much for sharing all of these wonderful thoughts and reflections and uh, giving us so much to think about when we go to see the ballet this week and we see seven grade. Well, I hope everybody enjoys it. And it's always a joy talking to you, Mary. I'm really delighted to welcome you, Miles. And thank you for taking time to join us today. We're all quite excited as we look forward to the sort of premiere this week of your piece, Color oh, Boys. I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to give our folks a little background about you. Um, from Atlanta, Georgia, Miles trained at the Herod Conservatory and then the Edward Ellison professional training program before entering San Francisco Ballet School trainee program in 2008. He was named an apprentice in 2009, joining the company as a member of the Corps in 2010, and was then promoted to soloist in 2020. As a dancer, we've seen him in a full range of ensemble and solo roles, often showing skills as an actor in the character roles. His choreography began to appear locally when he created works for San Francisco Ballet School Student Showcase beginning in 2012 with Spinney, followed in 2013 with Stone and Steel, which had quite a life, and in 2017 with Panorama. His work entered the main company rep in 2013 when his piece In the Passerine's Clutch was shown on the company's repertory season gala. In 2015, he was commissioned to create the piece Manifesto. Ghost in the Machine premiered in 2017. He was nominated for an Isadora Duncan Award for Outstanding Achievement in Choreography for each of these. And he was selected as one of the 12 choreographers for the 2018 Unbound Festival of New Works for which he choreographed Otherness. He's also created works for a number of companies outside the Bay Area, including the Joffrey Ballet, New York City Ballet and Charlotte Ballet, among others. And as much as I'd love to hear more about the career of the up and coming international choreographer, we really want to hear about color forms. So I'd like to jump into uh, how this season's piece came to be, starting as a pre pandemic commission. I'm going to let you just run with it, Miles. Sure thing. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and it's great to be here. And it's great to be continuing to make work here. I, I really just, I love the city and company and it's such an honor. Um, let's see, okay, we, I was commissioned for a stage work for our 2020 season, 2021 season? 20, 2020. 2020 season? Oh my God. I know, it's been, I know. It's been, it feels like even more years than it has been. Um, and as we all know, we were deviated from our, theater spaces due to the pandemic and um and we were as a company pivoting into the digital realm so i had i had chosen my music and and a little bit of kind of loose inspiration um when helgi asked me to um make a work for film instead of stage and so <laughs> the first thing i thought of is okay i how do we get into sf moma i I've, I've been to that museum so many times and it's always brought a smile to my face and I knew I, I expected they weren't open during the pandemic just as we weren't um, and I knew all of these arts organizations were trying to figure out ways to stay connected to their audiences and 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 the way I the way I was also thinking about this digital season is um 
in lieu of, you know, in the spirit of not having these spaces and moving outside of these spaces, how can we potentially potentially gain new audiences and continue to break down the walls that might keep people away from our artwork? Um, so those were all of the things I was kind of um, ruminating on as we were making the de decision to create color forms and what it means and how it relates to not only the dance world, but the arts world in general and the community of San Francisco in general. Well, so clearly you you said you began your idea for a piece, which of course was going to be on stage. Yes. And yeah. that, um, you know, the idea of film. And then you you said you just immediately thought of MoMA. So what is there about this piece that evokes being in a museum? Uh, do you mean about the film or the stage work? No, I, the, the original concept. The original piece. Yeah. I, well, I think... concept, to, concept for a stage piece yeah. to, I want to be in MoMA. Yeah. So well, back I have... to your concept. Yeah, I, I had... A lot of my initial inspirations for the original piece, which you know, I I had I hadn't started on with the dancers at all. It was really just like floating around in my brain. Um, but uh, one inspiration I had was the work of Alexander Calder, who um, did a lot of kinetic sculpture and mobiles. Um, yeah, and he was you know a mid-century artist, uh, had a very specific aesthetic, um, and. I loved I loved that concept for a lot of reasons. I think a the color palette he used was super um, engaging and kind of is having a moment again with these primary colors, um, but also just the way the asymmetry the the balance yet the asymmetry of these sculptures was really interesting to me. And what became even more apparent as we were stepping into this pandemic is how all of the pieces and the sculptures. Um, are connected to one another uh, and they're perfectly balanced even though they're not symmetrical but they're all they're all connected so if you move one over here something over here is affected and I thought I thought that was just a really beautiful starting point for even just um, movement inspiration and also I don't know I, I find myself creating a lot of ballet surrounding community and how we affect each other and so that just felt very in line with what I usually exploring in dance um so that initially i i knew they had an alexander calder exhibit at moma so i was like well <laughs> maybe maybe this was meant to be <laughs> oh wow yeah. well then then it became it be it be it came to life yes as a film and i remember loving it and i remember going all over san francisco with it so Give us a little background about the the fun and maybe challenges of your filming, and especially while we were still very much locked down and in pandemic mode. Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot of really special moments in that creation process because that that was the first time we as dancers were getting together uh, after shelter and the shelter in place ordinances. So we were coming back to the studio and just really working with the 10 of us to start with, maybe the 20 of us with another cast. Um, and so we were really, and, and for maybe, you know, three or four months we were working on it, um, which never happens here. Usually, you know, we, we have such a packed season and, and you know, we have just so many performances to prepare. So we're usually juggling all of these ballets. And it was really, it was really cool to focus on one thing and also with the same people it was i just it was a really special time for us um and also to be able to shoot not only in moma but in um the yerba buena center and in golden gate park and try to em embrace even more of the city than just our little pocket and um in the war memorial opera house was really special to me too and and also you know i think in the spirit of that is is how, how do we kind of insert dance into spaces that feel undanceable, <laughs> which, 
which I think my dancers were really generous and being like, yeah, I can dance on dirt. I can dance on mulch. I can dance on, you know, we, we figured out ways to kind of thread our world with um, the world outside of our theater in order to try and make the world in our theater more accessible and inviting. And I think that was really a, a fun challenge for me. And especially with all of the tools that we gain in using film and editing, um, we were able to make that really make sense. And, and that's, that's something I've, you know, I've always wanted to do a big dance film like this. And, and I know there are a lot of people who um, say that dance on film could encroach on dance and theater. Um, but I think they're two different mediums and I think you have to pro approach them very differently. And it's something I really wanted to prove could be successful in um, this ballet world where we don't see as much of it as in maybe the contemporary dance world. So it it was it was just a real treat for me. That was that was so fun. <laughs> well we should probably mention that out in the dirt, uh, the dancers were not wearing point shoes. No, 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 no. <laughs> Two questions have uh, risen in my mind. One was um I'm just I find it irresistible to imagine you, your camera crew and these fabulous, wonderful dancers galumphing through whether it was Golden Gate Park or wherever and the people who happened to ha who happened on you what were their reactions oh we got all sorts I remember being in Golden Gate Park and we had a family with two young kids just kind of sit and watch us for like an, an hour and a half it was it was amazing they were they I mean I'm sure they've never seen anything like that out in Golden Gate Park so I I'm I I'm glad they kind of were able to witness the the both you know the, a little bit of chaos and you know we had a big crane that day and drones and all of these separate things we had some people kind of on bikes come through and be like hey, do you have a permit for this and we're like well yes obviously we we had you know we had like trailers and we we had like the the full gamut um, and and did everything through the city especially since it was. Um, when we were in and out of COVID, well, really in COVID protocols, we we really had to um, move through the proper channels in order to capture all of this. Um, and with our own unions and everything, that's really important to the ballet that we do that properly. Um, and it was, it, you know, of course, there were so many logistics for Chris Dennis and the whole production team to manage, but um, we pulled it off. And and during a pandemic, I, it would have been hard enough without without the pandemic. But during a pandemic, is it's like a very giant feat that it happened. So I'm just really I'm I'm happy we got through it without a hitch, and and it was super fun. It was it was really incredible. Well, were there parts of it, if I'm remembering correctly, that were actually done in either studio or? Was it even the opera house? But the dancers yeah. were dancing on point in yeah, yeah, opera, yeah, in a proper space. Yes, so that happened. Yeah, yeah, that was great. We were able to kind of build all of these special environments that were actually just on our um, opera house stage uh, that were mimicking the galleries in the MoMA. Um, so that was really fun to kind of take a reference photo of an Ellsworth Kelly painting and then kind of pour it, wash it over the entire stage and figure out how to make different setups with these like um, big translucent screens we had. And we had all, we had some like prop mama benches that we would play with and make architecture with. So we were just trying to subvert the idea of where your imagination goes as you're experiencing art or, or experiencing things that we might not even see as art like uh I don't know like a tree like some something something that's even more organic than anything that the human humans make um but we can still find kind of magic and beauty in so that was a really fun task that I I feel like is way more in my wheelhouse because theater is kind of my bread and butter so it was really fun to to play with the things that I knew well and also trust the experts like um, my director, Ezra Hurwitz, and my director of photography, um, Ricardo Campos, to to play with those these two worlds and kind of see 
what we could make together. It was really fun. It was really cool. Well, speaking of pivot, now you're 100% on the Opera House stage. Ah. So um, just as a sort of a leading question, does the current piece reflect the work that you had originally envisioned back when you got the commission in whenever that was, 2019 or 20? Yeah. And, and how much of how much of the outside have you been able to bring in? Well, I think that's a great question. I it's hard. It's really hard for me to parse out. That's hard for me to parse out because essentially, as I was choreographing for the film, I you know I had some things in mind, but a lot of that was my starting point was like, okay, I'm going to know what I'm going to do, what I know how to do, which is make a ballet that can be run from point A to point B, you know, I, so chore I think choreographically, um, a ballet is going to be like, if I had a different set of dancers, a different set of circumstances, it's going to be different no matter what all of these other, um, oh. actors and brains and ideas are, are into play. But, um, but even as we were still storyboarding the film, I was making movement um, and it's really fun. So for the stage work, we'll kind of ex excavate all of these lost choreographic moments that we had to cut for the film. So we probably have, it's about I don't know, four, four or five minutes longer. Um, and at the same time, I still wanted to make a companion piece for the film and make something that really um encompasses the spirit of the film so so you know we will reference a museum gallery we we, we will reference um paper planes we will reference yeah. uh, places your imagination can take you once it's harnessed by something that you connect with um and i think those are and we will we will reference kind of this the the spirit of joy and wonder and exploration that the film has, but it'll it'll have, of course, like a different twist on it. So um, I wanted to make something that would be enjoyed by people who loved the film, but also be enjoyed by people who have never seen the film. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I'm setting out to do. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to kind of see that juxtaposition. It's gonna be fun. In the few minutes that we have left say um a bit about your choice of music the Steve Reich score and you talk about um you had to um add a bit to the stage version um where was that in the music um so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so talk about your music so I'm glad you didn't you didn't notice in the film but we do have a, a substantial cut um the way the the piece is structured is the first movement it's three movements. The first movement is almost 12 minutes. The second movement is six movements and uh, six minutes. And the third movement is three minutes. So it kind of, it kind of halves in size as it goes along. Um, and I've been wanting to use this music forever, but I couldn't figure out exactly how to navigate that structure for a stage work. Um, and so I was finally feeling kind of like I, I had an idea how to tackle it as I was, um, going into this project before I knew it was going to be a film, but um, it's, I love Steve Reich's work because it's so, it's minimalist, but it's driving and it's percussive. And even though it's a minimalist piece, it has so much evolving texture to it that um, it leaves a lot of room for me as a choreographer, but even more importantly, the dancers to play with. Uh, and I think that's, super exciting um so I, I don't know it just feels so danceable to me and and rhythmic um yeah we, and so so in this first 11 12 minute movement we had a cut in the film where um I think Ulrich drops his phone as he and Sasha are having this like imaginary uh, moment of connection in a museum and it kind of turns turns into an audiobook and then Jasmine kind of puts her headphones on again as she's out in the Yerba Buena Center, and we we shift to a later a later moment in the music, uh, um, yeah. and we also made a few cuts to repeats just to keep the pace moving on film. That um, I put most of those back in. I think we have a few little a few little cuts, but um, all in all, it's 
it's nearly in its entirety, um, which I think gives us just more room to to play and showcase the dancers, you know, just because we don't have the we don't have the um, the use of these quick edits anymore. So people will be crossing over or changing, maybe moving scenery. So all of that was important for me to kind of keep in to let the piece breathe as it's in a theater, as opposed to when it's on somebody's screen or phone or laptop or TV. Talking a minute or two about your dancers. You yes. mentioned uh, right. starting your creation, you had that pod. Yeah. It was a, the pods were sort of created um, outside of your choice, I'm imagining. They just, you, you just had your pod and then you create it. Um, now, there are some dancers who are no longer present. I'm sure that you have added a few. Talk about how you use individuals to assist your creative process. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have the luxury of um, working and dancing alongside everyone here at the company. So I see, I see everybody in so many different capacities um, and not only as, dancers but also as humans and and I think my job as a choreographer especially with this piece is to allow the dancers to be themselves <laughs> and connect with each other as themselves that's 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 what I am aiming for with this work is is to really showcase people's talents as they are um and so for me it's 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 important for me to meet dancers with they are where they are and kind of give them the platform to nail it like that is my goal as a choreographer um so it's been really fun to work with multiple casts just because we'll make different decisions for for people based on who they are as a dancer and um and it's been really fun to see them with the permission to allow it allow them to make the movement their own to see how different every different things read it's really it, like I feel like we're discovering a new ballet with another group of people and I think it's it's really fun like I think that's really like the playtime that we get is is to see where we can kind of push things and how far with people and like I, I'll be there to kind of of course like guide and give suggestions but um, I love when dancers you know, use their input and use their brains and feedback and challenge me as much as I challenge them. I think that's a really fun relationship that we get to have. And I think, you know, I've, I've worked with most of the dancers in this company at this point. So um, that working relationship just gets deeper and richer, the more we understand how to communicate and the more we understand what each other are looking for. Um, so that's a really special relationship to me. And I, I just value that so much in my life. <laughs> We're going to move into wrapping up mode here, but I do want to um, kind of in wrapping up, say this program has been titled The Colors of Dance. And this program is interesting because it's going to open with seven for eight, which is black and black. And then it closes with Blake Works One, which is Everyone is in this lovely blue, kind of pale blue. Your piece in the middle is called Color Forms. And my recollection watching the film is that there's just primary color all over. You've already talked about that a little bit. So um, your costuming and your set, um, just two words about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, I do three. <laughs> three. Um, I just want to shout out my costume designer, Susan Romer, who is a longtime collaborator with me. And she's she's someone who always will um, ask questions about like the true intention of something and then deliver a product that will make it better than I could have on my own. Um, and so she, she was really specific about the color palette that we chose for the film, which I think reads so well and they just like jump off the screen at you. So I think, I think we are yes anding that for the stage. Um, so it's a starting point, but I, I don't think it's the ending point for our aesthetic. And I think that's gonna be really fun to see after seeing the film. 
Um, I don't know if I wanted to say too much more than that. Um, but but yeah, you, you, you we'll definitely see <laughs> see the the looks and styles that we had in the film, uh, just because I think they're too beautiful to not utilize. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Well, we do have to to wrap up. I want to thank you so much. I know you need to rush back into rehearsals. We're looking forward to this exciting week of wide variety of dance. Oh, the audience is going to be given such a treat. And I'm just also very excited that this piece, which has had such an interesting journey, is now going to be live for us right on the Opera House stage. So thank you, Miles. Thank you so and much. look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, I'll see you at the Opera House. Well, I'm here with Katita Waldo. It's always a pleasure to hear from Katita, who today will be talking about William Forsythe's Blake Works One, which we'll be seeing uh, as the closer on program five, The Colors of Dance. So just a bit about Katita, who is pretty well known to all of us. Uh, she trained at San Francisco Ballet School prior, prior to joining the company in 1988. She was promoted to soloist in 1990 and principal dancer in 94, and then retired 22 years later in 2010. During those years, she performed principal roles in a diverse repertory of works by acclaimed choreographers, including George Balanchine, Laura Lubavitch, Helgi Thomason, Christopher Wilden, and of course, William Forsythe. Second phase of her career, staging ballets, actually began uh, when uh, Yuri Posakov asked her to stage his piece, Magritte Mania, for the Bolshoi Ballet. And then following this, Christopher Wilden asked her to join him as choreographer's assistant on his creation of Misera Cordis, also for the Bolshoi Ballet. Then in 2008, Helgi Thomason asked Katita to serve as the rehearsal director for two of the premieres in the New Works Festival. And then 2010, as she was retiring from performing, the classical roles, she was appointed rehearsal director. And I might add that we continue to see her frequently on stage in beloved character roles. So she has served as rehearsal director now on works by Julia Adam, George Balanchine, Edward Liang, John Neumeyer, and Alexei Rutmansky, and then of course, William Forsythe, among many others. In addition to teaching the company and in San Francisco Ballet School, Katita has taught both nationally and internationally. So thank you so much, Katita, for finding time during this intense rehearsal process to join us for this discussion about William Forsythe's Lake Works One. My pleasure. Um, let's, uh, and you know, welcome. <laughs> let's really just start with your experience dancing the works of William Forsythe. How was it to encounter his his style and his creative process early on? Um, it was revolutionary for me. I think I was definitely my original uh, original training when I first started dancing was very classical. And then I moved to the States and was introduced to more Balanchine and uh, went to North Carolina School of the Arts and got a little bit more of a diverse education and was exposed to more different kinds of dance. But um, particularly partnering was pretty much partnering was partnering. You know, it didn't really matter what the ballet was. It was the guy holds the girl up and, you know, lifts her from time to time and pretty basic stuff. Um, my first experience with, with uh, Forsyth was uh, early days. He came and did a ballet called New Sleep, yeah. which I was not a part of, but I was a, uh, uh, just amazed, astounded audience member and in the room when he was working and watching this ballet be created. Um, but the first time I danced a Forsyth piece was uh, in the middle, somewhat elevated when he brought that here. And we were the, I believe we were the first American company to dance it. Possibly, possibly. I know that... The vertiginous shell of exactitude, we were the first company to perform in the US. But um, my first Forsyth piece was that. And I had the privilege of um, 
I was one of the little the side girls, but I also was asked to learn the the um, I don't remember if it was the actual Sylvie Guillem role or the one that I eventually ended up dancing uh, Isabel Garan role. There are two principal women roles, and I I can't believe I can't remember. I learned them both, but I only performed the uh, Isabel Garan. That was that was the part that I ended up doing the most. And what was amazing was his uh, approach to partnering because it had more to do with counterbalance and it, it gave this incredible dynamic to the movement. And uh, we were able to use our bodies in ways that we'd never used them before, both as dancers and as partners. And it was the kind of thing where because of the way he used counterbalance, it didn't matter the height or the size of the dancers. If you counterbalanced the right way, you could have a little guy dancing with a really tall woman or vice versa. It just didn't matter. And his movement, the type of movement was so um, different for us at the time. It was um, massive and huge and, and, and uh, really fun, <laughs> really fun to dance. Um, and I remember every time we did middle, you just felt like the coolest thing on the planet. And I, that was, that was my first introduction. Um, then what was the next thing we did? I guess, it, I guess it was vertiginous and vertiginous. I was in the original cast of original American cast of vertiginous thrill. And I had been, I was a principal by the time we did it, if I'm not mistaken. And I hadn't cried for years and I cried. I <laughs> cried. It was one of the hardest it remains one of the hardest ballets of uh, stamina wise ever, ever. And um, Bill jokes that the last step of the vertiginous thrill is everybody on the floor after the curtain goes down because you're so utterly exhausted. You cannot stand up. And uh, that was um, Punishing, but also, again, with all Forsyth work, I find it so rewarding and so fun. Uh, and then we did Artifact Suite, which I also, I loved. And uh, I got to do that with Ruben Martin Cintas, which was really fun. There were two potatoes in that one as well. And um, that was just wonderful. And I loved the second movement, which was just the core. But the patterns and the music and the rhythms and the, the movement is so, Forsyth's movement is so big and it's so extreme. And that was, I just loved it. And now we're, uh, now it's Blake Quirks. And I think there was one other in the middle, in, in between, which you might have been involved with, and that's Pop Arts. Oh, yes, of course. How yeah. could I forget? Pop Arts. Yeah, I was rehearsal director by the time we did that one. Yeah. And that was um, same same idea. It was just a really cool piece to, to look at. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get to dance that one. Obviously, I was retired by then. But it was with all Forsyth's work. It's like, wow. I'd love to do that one. I'd love to put them point shoes back on and go out there and do that. And you just feel like that. And Blake Works has been, has been fun because I actually had to set it, the women, the core women. Uh, I'm sharing the rehearsal duties uh, with Felipe Diaz. And he was put in charge of the men and the principals. And I was asked to uh, learn and, and set and teach the women. So I, we had a, a man come out named Eamon Harper to help stage it, but he didn't, he didn't do the women's part. So I had to learn it, which meant learning Blake works myself and then teaching it. So in a way it felt like I did get to dance it and I oh, it was just so fun. It's so fun. And the music is great and the songs are fun. And, you know, sometimes you work on ballets where you don't want to hear that music ever again. And, and Blake work is not one of those pieces. I just, I never get tired of listening to the songs. I really enjoy them. Love working with my ladies and, and, and seeing what they're able to do and how they approach the, the Forsyth work and coaching them on it. And, um, you know, taking all of the years of experience that I had working with Bill and with his dancers and, and helping them to achieve as best I can um, the aesthetic and the, the Bill Forsyth look. So 
Well, many questions have just flown through my mind as I'm listening to you. And I'm going to start with the last one because it's the one I remember. Um, oftentimes, a rehearsal director who is staging works that are already created doesn't necessarily get a chance to work with the creator. Yes. They're being handed down through repetitors and so on. Uh, you actually have the advantage of having worked with Bill himself. Yes. So that's a big plus, I'm sure. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, I was there, like I said, at the beginning of, of his, I wouldn't say his career, obviously, but early days of his choreography, at least in the United States. And he was already developing his vocabulary. Um, and he has a very definite vocabulary. There's a lot of opposition. There's a lot of um, weight displacement. There's a lot of, um, he loves extreme positions. So when your arm is out to the side, it's not just out to the side, it has to be reaching, you know, to, to the extremes of the, the building, energy out of your body, everything exaggerated. And, and um, he has uh, ways of placing your weight when you do like an arabesque where it's not just an arabesque. It's an arabesque that's slightly twisted in an unusual way. And um, he has, it depends on the ballet, but um, uh, some of it is a little bit more... Uh, contemporary and loose, but his basic foundation is classical dance. And Blake work, um, Blake works one was a return and an homage to classical dance. It just like vertiginous, vertiginous was, you know, take classical ballet and put it on speed <laughs> and let them go. And this was a return to uh, honoring classical dance. So it's not, even though it has those, uh, physical quirks that are that are Forsyth, he was very specific that he wants it to be very clean, very clear, um, classical, and then extreme. So you take a classical position, and then you make it more extreme, but it's got to be classical, it can't be interpreted in the same way that some of his other works can be. Sure. I read an article some recently about um, the obsession was the point of view of the article with high extensions. Mm -hmm. The article actually goes way back in ballet history, but what jumped out at me was crediting William Forsyth in the early 1980s with introducing high extensions as the new norm. And I was fascinated by that. And of course, if we look at contemporary ballet now, um, you just expect to see kind of ridiculously split extensions. And I think his work with Sylvie Guillem yes. kicked that off um, yeah. in the middle. Yeah. So we're talking about extremes, and I think that might be yes. one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think, uh, well, when you're working with a dancer like Sylvie Guillem, how could you ignore that facility and that ability to put their legs in places in the air that have never been seen before. So, yeah. And that, yeah, I, yeah, that's an interesting point. I can definitely see how it, it became the standard to try to achieve that level of flexibility and that level of height with your legs in arabesque to the front, to the side. Yes, definitely. Turning to the music and you've mm -hmm. already talked a little bit about how much fun it is to listen to the song. So I want to hear more about this piece of music in general, but just a couple of sentences of introduction about Forsyth's broad use of music. I'm thinking the electronic scores mm -hmm. and the Tom Dillons and the Schubert yes. symphony of Vertiginous. Yes. Now here we are with this remarkable set. Yes, I think that's one of the fun things about um, about Forsyth. My my introduction to him was the the Tom Willems scores. I can't remember if New Sleep was Tom Willems, but Middle was for sure, and um, so was Pop Arts. Pop Arts was definitely. I can't remember what was the music for Artifact Suite. I should look that up. I can't remember. I don't think it was Willems, but I'm not sure. I think it's some Bach. There was, yes, there was, but there was, yes, it was, I'm sorry, it was Yo-Yo Ma. It was a recording of Yo-Yo Ma, and he chose not to use live music. But I can't, the second movement was something completely different. 
which was one of the reasons that the ballet was so interesting is that you had this Bach composition for the beginning and then this other composition that was so different and, and very rhythmic. Um, and that was a, a wonderful contrast. Um, so yeah, he has, um, he's an ever curious artist who is constantly looking for for things to investigate, explore, learn, um, musically, physically, dance-wise. I know that he was, um, uh, recently, he was uh, doing something with hip hop, I wanna say, where he was exploring everything that the body can do. And he's, he's just a, a student of physicality and movement and movement to music, so. Say a little more about the Blake. The Blake, Blake Works. Blake Works um, was is based on a piece. I think it's called Blake Works, which is the songs of a of a singer named James Blake. I believe he's British, and it's it's very. Uh, when yes, I'm jumping in. There's an album called The Colors of Music. The Colors, uh, yes, and that's the, that's the one. Seven, yes, seven songs from this. Yes. Yeah. And so Blake works is set. Thank you very much. Um, I keep getting confused because there's a song called the color of anything. That's one of the songs, but um, I, all of the songs are very different. Uh, they obviously have the James Blake sound, but the mood of each of the, of the songs is very different. And I, I love the way that Bill has, has captured the, the mood of each of those of those songs. And there, uh, I'd never heard James Blake before, but I, I'm going to be listening to him again and again and again, because I really enjoyed um, the music and the pas de deux, the pas de deux in this ballet, especially to the music are so beautiful and so different from each other. There's two big pas de deux. And I, I love the way he interprets the music. It was just wonderful. Do the lyrics, should we pay attention to the lyrics? Do the lyrics matter or is it more just the feel? I think it depends on the, on the song. Um, yes, it, especially with the pot of does, I think that there's a relationship for sure. I, I had the, the first Potida, and again, forgive me, I'm I'm forgetting the title of it. Um, there's, I have a resonance with it because of a personal situation of of mine, and it it gets me every time. Yeah. I just, I cry. I hear those words, and I just I cry. And and it's uh it's beautiful. But yes, I think especially the especially the two potidas. I think definitely are informed by the lyrics and the, and the sound and the music. Uh, the group pieces are a little less, uh, have less to do with the lyrics. Um, but they're fun. They're really fun. My memory of seeing it, we did see it last year. Yes, we did. Was that as it ended, everyone's smiling. Yes. Seems sitting very an up moment. Well, we're going to be wrapping up pretty quickly now, but um, in the three or so minutes we have left, um, the way Forsyth uses his dancers, and I'm speaking individuals. Mm -hmm. So um, we've heard, we know, as we've read, uh, Sylvie Guillaume created that part of it. Well, every dancer who's done it ever since seems to be needing to um, inhabit the persona of Sylvie Guillaume. Does he do that with all or many of his works? Or is there room for a new cast, a new company doing his works to uh, create something a little different? He always wants different. Mm -hmm. And I remember we worked on In the Middle Somewhat Elevated, the Potter for a gala recently, and it was it was during the pandemic. And it was Sasha Mukamadov and Aaron Robeson. And he very specifically did not want them to be anybody but who they were. And he actually, um, Aaron did something and did different legs or different steps. And he said, oh, I love that. Let's, for you, for you, we'll add 
a little batu here. And he wouldn't do that for anybody else. He would do it just for him. And Sasha, the same thing. For this dancer, I'd have her do X, Y, or Z or attack this in this way. But for you, this is better. You you do this. So he he doesn't want copycats at all. Um, and I believe, and I could be mistaken, that with Blake Works, his idea was he wanted originally to not use the established dancers at Paris Opera. He wanted to use new, new young dancers. So most of the cast was not, um, it was not well-known dancers because he wanted to focus on the next generation and make this piece using the next generation. Um, so yeah, no, he's he's he definitely doesn't rest on his laurels or, or want things to be the way they've always been. It's a constant evolving art form for him. And uh, and it's even if you see middle today, it'll just be a very different ballet, very different ballet with different interpretation, even if the steps are the same. So, yeah. Well, it feels like I wish we had another 15 minutes that we could talk about another bunch of aspects and your experiences as being a rehearsal director versus a dancer. Um, we do have to wrap up. Uh, I do want to say, I think, Lake Works is going to be a wonderful ending to this mixed bill. Yes. We start with the most uh, classical and classical and traditional, and we go into something quite new and different. And then we finish with this flash of exuberance and color, Lake Works. Yes. So um, looking forward. And I hope the audiences will just have a little something for everyone. Yes, yes. And uh, again, you've been a busy bunch of folk coming off of Giselle. So I want to thank you very much for spending this time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And everybody, please enjoy the performance. Uh, the performance says it's going to be a tremendous program and come back and see the rest of the season. Cinderella, Romeo and Juliet. We keep going. Enjoy. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Points of View. For more information about the artists, performances, and our other educational programs, please visit sfballet.org. Visit us online to watch more episodes of Points of View. A new episode is released on YouTube and Facebook on the Monday before each program's opening night and continues to be available online until the end of the season. See you at the ballet!